going to switch gears, and I want to talk about, this is one of my favorite things to do, I want to systematically go through Bible characters. I talked, a little, I talked in greater detail about Nehemiah. I talked briefly about David, and I'm going to circle back with him. But here's the key. When you read these stories, don't just try to get your three chapters in in the morning. Don't just try to get, you know, finish the Bible in a year. Nothing wrong with three chapters. Nothing wrong with finishing the Bible in a year. But ask the Holy Spirit, this is my prayer request for you, to show you the biblical, the, ma the masculine side of these stories. Because when I, when I get done, I, I believe that you're going to have some aha moments, and a lot of light bulbs are going to go off that you've never seen before. And I, remember, each one of our lives will serve as an example or a warning and when you read about someone in the Bible, ask yourself, is this guy an example? Is he a warning? What should I learn from him? What should I avoid that he's done? If it, like I said, if it took him 20 years to mess up his life and I can learn about it in this 20-minute devotional, help me, Holy Spirit. Let's get after it. David. Now, the principle that I want to teach you from David's life is simply this. This is powerful. <clears throat> David was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. When he had the incident with Bathsheba, scholars estimate that he was 50-some-odd years old. It occurs in the mid-portion of 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, he's already king of the northern and southern tribes. But listen to what I said. I said he was a good man. Everybody in this room here, I believe, is a good man. I believe I'm a good man. But if you put me in a bad place in a weak moment, hello, so you have to make sure that you set up boundaries, that you erect boundaries, that you, that you make sure that you study yourself like your worst enemy, and thus you become your own best friend. Satan is your worst enemy, and he studies you. Now, he's not omnipotent like God, but what he does is he keeps files. He keeps empirical data, and he knows what works with you and what doesn't. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll realize that if you look at your life, there's certain things that cause you to scratch where you itch. David was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. And that could be any of us. You know, do you realize that it's been estimated now that over, I read a statistic, one-fourth, and I'm not passing judgment, I'm just telling you a stat, one-fourth of the divorce proceedings have Facebook somewhere written in the proceedings. Now, this is deep because it's real easy to get engaged in a moment or a season of life. And the enemy's so subtle, he'll bring you back to, like, the back seat of a car or the corner of a party or a dorm room moment. And he'll draw you away from your wife and draw you towards someone. And we'll be gullible enough to think that we can go back to that moment. It's going to be exactly like that, and it's been like that all the way up until now. When you don't know what in the world is going on with that person, in the last 20, 15, 5, 10, 30 years. Now, trust me, I'm not against Facebook. I, my ministry is on Facebook. But I'm showing you how subtle it is because things like that can draw you in. It can get you, you, you know, you got a beef with the wife. Okay, I'm going to fire up the computer, look up so-and-so, live chat. What's going on? Da, da, da. Next thing you know, you're in a bad place emotionally in a weak moment. And infidelity starts emotionally first before it culminates physically. David was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. If you read the story, it says, and at the time that kings went out to battle, David stayed home. Man, be careful when you're not where you're supposed to be. And it says, and one evening when David woke up, in other words, he was taking a nap. In other words, it's, it's, it kind of gives the impression that he was bored. Be careful what you do when you're bored. Remember, halt. Be careful what you do when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're tired, and when you're lonely. Because those are those will get you in trouble. And remember, Satan's greatest aspect against us, besides deception, he's patient. Like a soda machine, 25 cents here, 5 cents here, 10 cents here, and then boom, he goes for the knockout. And it, he'd rather wait till you're 52, Dave, where he can get more bang for the buck, and taking you out early. So he was a good man at a bad place in a weak moment. He's looking out, the, he's being a peeping Tom, basically, when he should have been out to battle. 
So we want to really guard against this. David's life teaches us, as we already talked about, that no amount of public success can make up for being a failure at home. I think we've hammered that pretty clearly. It's deep because I believe David had a father wound. What's a wound? A wound is an unresolved issue that's currently impacting my lifestyle. A wound is an unresolved issue that's currently impacting my lifestyle. An unresolved issue that's currently impacting how I conduct myself. David had a father wound. When Samuel came to find the kings, and he's talking to Jesse, Dave's pop, Dave's pop's going through the line of, I got this son, I got this son, I got this son. After he goes through a couple of sons, Samuel says, well, is there anyone else? Oh, yeah, 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 this is other, this is other kid, but he's out of the backyard tending the sheep. I believe that David had somewhat of a father wound. We don't know the origin of it. A lot of it's speculative. You don't know. He, David said, I was brought forth in iniquity in Psalm 51. We don't know whether his father Jesse had him and he had a beef with the woman that he had him with, so that caused him to minimize David. We don't know all that. But some, what's, what's crystal clear is when Samuel came to find the king and he asked Jesse, David was an afterthought. Now, this is powerful because... You would think, listen to me carefully, you would think with that backdrop and, and feeling the way he felt about his father, Jesse, that the, his knee-jerk reaction would have been, well, I'm going to do the exact opposite with my sons. Yet, if you study his children, the only son that he really did a great job raising was Solomon. Adonijah tried to take the throne. Absalom tried to kill him. I mean, if I had time, I have a 15-week teaching just on David's life. I know this man. And you would think that being brought up in that environment and seeing how that made him feel, the first thing he would have done was not repeat it. But his life teaches us just because you don't like what you saw modeled, it doesn't mean of your own volition you have the tools to change it. You got to come to meetings like this. You got to buy books. You got to buy tapes. You got to be mentored by someone who's handling his business. David's life shows us that. So we want to just, there's so much I could say, but just remember, he was a good man in a bad place in a weak moment. His life shows us how men run away from things they don't do well. When they heard, when they said there's a giant trying to take over, read the Bible, it says David ran towards Goliath, but he ran away from his kids when they were looking for him. The Bible tells us Absalom spent two years in the same city as David. And David didn't see him once, two years. That's why it cut him so much when Absalom was killed. Because he realized he missed his moment. Love Daniel. His name, man, the principle you want to learn from Daniel's life is he lived an uncompromising life in a compromising world. Now, I like this cat. If you, if you follow my ministry, I'm drawn towards people like Daniel, Nehemiah, and Joseph for one primary reason. Because they were lay people. They weren't clergy. They weren't fivefold officers. They weren't ministers. They weren't pastors, bishop, teachers. They were regular cats in the marketplace. This is deep. Because Daniel's name means my God is judge. In other words, everywhere Daniel went, he had this background music that my God's got my back. My God is judge. He will vindicate me. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. He's called Jehovah Gomorrah the God of recompense, the God who says, don't grow weary and well-doing for your reap in due season if you faint not. In modern day terms, we would call him the God who's got your back. It's interesting because he, one of the names of God is the, uh, the Lord of hosts. That means there's certain, there are all sorts of descriptive names, but the Lord of hosts means the Lord of commander in chief. In other words, when it, when it comes time to your purpose and what he's called you to do, he puts on the armor of the Lord of hosts. In other words, the Lord who's the commander in chief. In other words, the Lord who's El Elyon, the most high God. Higher than your boss, higher than your problems, higher than the sickness. He's the Lord of hosts, El Elyon. So Daniel went around with the mentality that my God is judge. It's deep because nothing, Daniel, Joseph, and Nehemiah, nothing in the Bible is written negative of them. 
They're one of the few men who have a pretty clean slate. It doesn't mean they were perfect, but in their biographies, they have a very clean slate. And what's also very powerful is when we meet Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, this really resonates with me, he's a teenager. By the time the sixth chapter comes along, he's 80. He has been through three different administrations. Democrats can slow him down. Republicans can slow him down. Independents can slow him down. Because he said, he walked around saying, my God is judge. And if you read the Bible, it tells us that God made him 10 times wiser than everybody else. In other words, his gifting was spiritual. Listen to me carefully. But the expression of it was natural. Every guy in this room wants that. Every guy wants to be able to show a spiritual gifting in a natural, not, not uh, something that only Christians can appreciate, that the world looks at you and say, boy, that's tight. You are 10 times better than me. There's not even a pro athlete who's 10 times better than his peers, not even LeBron. You pick the, the all-star athlete, he's, he's good, he's, he excels, but he's not 10 times better. Daniel was 10 times better, eight times in this story, the word wisdom, it pops up. And if you were there when I was at your church, it talks about how, I talked about how he excelled, and I talked about the power of excellence. He excelled because he had an excellent spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of Christians doing whack jobs, doing worse than the world. You're trying to help a brother out, give him some business, throw a bone his way and then you have to have it replaced, repaired, done over, because it's not a spirit of excellence. Daniel had an excellent spirit. And what's deep is Daniel kept winning against the odds. Every guy in this room wants to win against the odds. Every guy wants to show that, I want my Christian beliefs to be validated. Now, we, don't, we shouldn't live like that, but if we're honest, we, we want to show that this work, this commitment, this consecration, this sacrifice, this investment is proving, showing forth in something meaningful, intangible in character ways, intangible in productive ways. The reason Daniel got promoted was because of his productivity. And Daniel was solving a problem for an unsaved king just like Joseph was, just like Nehemiah. These people were working for, they were in the world. See, you want to study these people. They weren't working in the church. They weren't working in a seminary. They're working in the world where it's cutthroat. Do what you got to do. And God was promoting them. It says, when, what's deep about Daniel is, is it, his reputation preceded him. When kings would reference him, Listen to what they say. In Daniel 5, 14, it says, And I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and an excellent wisdom are found in you. This is what the world's saying about him. Daniel 5, 16, And I have heard of you, not you kiss butt, now you, not you brown nose right, now, not you went out to dinner, not you laughed at the jokes that you thought were stupid. No, it says, I have heard it. There's something different about you. Now, you know what made Daniel different? It boils down to this. You can read about it in 1 Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. See, you're not going to live morally pure by accident. You're not going to have money in retirement by accident. You're not going to stay in good physical health by accident. You're not going to stay married by accident. You're going to have to purpose in your heart that I'm going to do what I got to do to make this work. You're going to have to be fixed, resolved. Joshua said, don't look to the right or to the left. Paul said in Philippians 3, this one thing I do. David said, my heart is fixed. We're talking about focus. Here's a, here's a simple question. How do you distract a man with a goal? Answer, give him another one. Give him another one. So if, if your goal is to do something with a kingdom agenda and someone could get you in, in a beef, in strife, 
trying to vindicate yourself, you've lost sight of your original goal and moved on to a secondary one. Now, I could say so much about this, but he refused to let them Babylonianize him, so to speak. He wasn't, he wasn't going to let the world slip in him because he purposed in his heart. And what's deep is, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 28, in the New American Standard Bible, it says this. I love this verse. It says, and Daniel enjoyed success. Listen to me carefully. It doesn't say Daniel was successful. It says he enjoyed success. There are people in the NFL, NBA, who are making players, making $9 million a year, and as soon as they find out someone else is making 10, they stop enjoying success. Because it's always natural. See, we always, the Bible says, measure themselves with themselves, comparing themselves is not wise. Second, Second Corinthians 10, 12 tells us. And you always compare yourself along the lines of race, face, place, or grace. Race, skin color, face, beauty, place, statue where you are. So, and if you ever notice, you always compare yourself to someone doing better. You never say, God, man, how come I'm not like that person in Guatemala <laughs> who doesn't know where, where the next meal is coming from? No, see, it's insidious. Comparison is designed to make you feel inferior. Daniel enjoyed success. The life of Solomon teaches us, here you go, y'all. You don't have to be down and out. You can be up and out. You can be seven figures and out. You can be ten figures and out. Nobody was as paid as Solomon. 700 wives, 300 girlfriends. He could have had a different woman every night for two years straight and some. Three years straight, two years straight. And yet, it was all vanity, vanity under the sun. His life teaches us, this is deep, Solomon's life teaches you that, hear me carefully, you can get exactly what you want from life, but apart from God gracing you to enjoy it, it's empty. You can get the car, get the six-figure income, get the seven-figure income, get the eight-figure income, get the cornered office, get whatever you want. You put a picture frame, and then you say hypothetically, whatever goes in here, it'll make me happy. Solomon wants you to know that's a lie. And what's deep about it is when you... When you read Ecclesiastes, which is like his journal, read the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, don't read it for doctrinal purposes because it, it was written when Solomon was in a backslidden state. But it shows you the mind of man. It's almost like Solomon's like, yo, check it out, y'all. Sit down, son. Let me talk to you. And he starts going through his credentials for one reason and one reason alone to prove to you, dude, if I can't do it, don't spin your wheels. <laughs> if I couldn't do it, don't save your money. If she couldn't do it, two or three a night, don't waste your time. He opens up by saying, he talks about how he's the preacher, the teacher. And he literally, I think the Holy Spirit is outlining his credentials so that he can dissuade you. If he can't get it done, you can't either. Even you read the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, look at all the personal pronouns. I don't have time, but you'll read things like, and I built myself castles, and I did my, built myself this, and I, and me, and my, and my castles, and my staff. All these personal pronouns, his life teaches us you can get exactly what you want. Not, not part of what you want, exactly. If you have something in your mind that you think, once you get it, I've arrived. Solomon says, bet against because once you get it, it'll be something else. I like to call him Solo Man, because he didn't have a running mate either. He was the Lone Ranger. When you're as large as Solomon, who speaks into your life? Who, who is Solomon accountable to? More money than Bill, makes Bill Gates look like a pauper? Enough women to every night? He, he wrote music. He was a rap artist. He wrote poetry. He had staff. And he's not even being humble about it. He's like, look, look let me tell you about my resume. 
He's like, dude, I'm trying to, sh I'm trying to shorten your learning curve, bro. <laughs> if I couldn't get it, you can't. It can't be done. It can't be bought. He has a verse in there. Don't have time to talk about it. Wish I had spent 20 minutes on this. Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has planted eternity in the hearts of men. Now, this is deep because we, there are two dimensions of time. There's eternity, there's time, and then there's eternity. Eternity is duration without end. In other words, God lives in eternity. He's alpha and omega, beginning and end. God doesn't have a birthday. He doesn't have a dead day. But I live in time. I was born January 25th, 1967. If I died January 25th, 2067, that would be 100 years in time. So when Solomon said God has planted eternity in the hearts of men, he's saying God has taken something from his realm, eternity, and he's deposited it in your realm, time, and he's saying give birth to it. And then he's saying don't come back here with what I sent you there to deposit. That's why the older you get, the more stress you feel. Because eternity is screaming at you in time, saying, buddy, get your act together. The clock's ticking. The hourglass has flipped over. You gotta, you're running out of time. Eternity is screaming at you in time, saying, don't waste time. Don't come back here with what I sent you there to deposit. Don't come back here with the business that I sent you there to deposit. Don't come back here with a song or book that I sent you there to deposit. Don't bring the ministry. We don't need the ministry back here. We need it there in time. So there's this vacuum, this void that Solomon wants you to get. He's trying to tell you, attorney's talking to you in time, dude. Don't waste your time. You, solo man, you never see him surrounded by another accountability person. So much I can say about his life. But his whole goal in that book of Ecclesiastes is to discourage you from wasting time on things that don't have an eternal purpose. Moses' life is divided into three 40-year DVDs. The first 40 years... He's the fresh prince of Egypt. Everything was going his way. The next 40 years, he's cleaning sheep dung, backside of the mountain. In the next 40 years, he's dealing with a bunch of complaining people in the wilderness. The life of Moses teaches us that this is deep. You can be an overnight failure. What do you think on day, year 40, day one, when Moses woke up, and just 24 hours ago, he was the fresh prince of Egypt, and now he's, he's staring at sheep butt, cleaning sheep dung. Have you ever woken up and said, how in the world did I get here? I mean, wait, wait, wait. 24 hours ago? Yesterday? What? 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 How? And you see, this is why the enemy's slick. Because Moses got out of God's timing. Oh, man, I wish we had days to talk about this. And when Acts 7.22 said Moses was learning all the wisdom and eloquence of the Egyptians, yet when God called him, he said, but I can't, because I... So I, 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 do you realize that getting out of God's timing caused Moses to lose confidence in a gift that he inherently possessed? Doing it his way. He said, no, I, I don't need you, Lord. I'll kill them. I'll kill them one at a time. Forget the Red Sea. That's inconvenient. I don't get as much fanfare. I'll kill them one at a time. I'll do it my way. Got out of, he knew he was a deliverer, but he didn't follow God's timing. And once he did that, the enemy pounced on him. He was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was eloquent, the Bible says, Acts 7.22, in word and deed, 
eloquent in word and deed. Eloquent in word and deed. Yeah. Yet when God says, you're going to be my spokesman. So I, but I, 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 because the enemy rattled his cage. Yeah. <laughs> Moses teaches us that you can be an overnight failure, not doing it God's way, even when you have the credentials. And he had to wait. You know, I, I was telling Dennis on the way up here, I went to a GMC dealer because they had a recall on my car. Moses had to wait for a recall on his assignment, small problem, took 40 years. Don't mess around with God's timing. It says the steps of a man are ordered by the Lord, not the leaps. It says your word is a light unto my feet, not a high beam. Stay connected. Be faithful at your post. Someone says, Brother Chris, I do not know what to do. I'm glad you came. Do the next right thing. I've been praying. What, what should I do, Lord? Simple. What's the next right thing? Is it an apology? Is it writing a creditor? Is it going home and talking to your wife? Is it calling that child you haven't spoken to? Just do the next right thing. But Brother Chris, what happens? What do I do after that? Do the next right thing again. You know what Moses experienced? This is deep. Moses experienced the intoxication of success in one season of his life. And then the next season, he experienced the devastation of failure. Success can be intoxicating. I was 25 years old. I got in an MBA training program at 25. Sorry, at 22. When I was 25, I made vice president at 25. I was on the fast track. When, when, when God's blessing you like that, success is intoxicating. Power, position, prestige, possession. But I've had seasons in my life where I've experienced the devastation of insignificance. Poured my life out. We had something called the Man Church. I had, poured, I had done all this work in New York City. It was, a, it was a church just for men. And we had 100 guys the first meeting. We were fired up. Then it went to 60, second meeting. Then it went to 25, third meeting. By the fourth meeting, we couldn't get 10 guys there. Here we're thinking we're getting ready to start something. The devastation of insignificance. When you give it your all, but you get small back. That's what Moses' life teaches us. You hang around me. Anyone who knows my ministry knows this. I have one man that I cannot wait to meet when I get to heaven. While you cats are chilling with Jesus, chilling with Paul, I want to just kick it with one dude and one dude only, and that man's name is Joseph. He is my favorite Bible character. What, you know what Joseph's life teaches you? Joseph was a man. Why are we talking about this? Are we just trying to fill up space in the retreat? No, you need to study their lives. You need to get those CDs and ask the Lord, what's the bold print? I want to learn from these guys. I want to be an example. I don't want to be a warning. I don't want to be an overnight failure. I don't want to get out of your timing. I don't want the enemy to rattle my cage. And, and, and I'm going around saying, I, 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 what, I thought you were learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. You were mighty in word and deed, right? Moses, what happened? I don't want to be that dude. When I inherently possess something, but I can't express it because I got out of God's timing, Joseph was a man, this is deep, who kept doing right with wrong happening to him. This is tight. He kept doing right. He kept going home trying to make his wife feel good, but she had a snapshot or a photograph of him from 10 years ago, and she refuses to update it. He kept sending his kids to Christian camps and Christian programs, but yet they kept being wayward. He kept doing a good job at work, and yet they kept overlooking him. Now, this is deep. It'd be one thing if Joseph did this for a month. 
It'd be a whole nother ball game if Joseph did this for a year. But Joseph spent 13 years doing right with wrong happening to him. Somebody says, I've been having marriage problems, Brother Chris, 13 years. I've been having financial problems, Brother Chris, 13 years. I've been having career problems, Brother Chris. And for some of you, it may have been that long and longer. But Joseph is a man. You want to study his life because he kept doing right and wrong was happening to him. But let me tell you something about Joseph. Joseph is one of the few men in the Bible who finished strong. Now catch this. It took Joseph 13 years to get on top. Please don't miss this. But when he got there, he stayed 80. If someone told you the hell that you're going through, would you pay the price tag if once you pass the test and get in God's timing, you could stay there 80 years? You'd probably say, all right, that, that, that's a little different. When he got on top, he stayed. Love that man. Joseph's life teaches us, listen to this, he refused to give anyone so much control that they, they could steal what God was trying to do in his life. He refused to give anyone so much control. Jesus put it like this, no man takes my life, I lay it down. Is an ex-spouse taking your life? Is a boss at work taking your life? Is an emotionally distant father taking your life? Is a smother mom who uh, committed emotional incest in that when your father was absent, she wanted you to take over that role? Did she take your life? Joseph refused to let anybody have so much power that they could steal what God was trying to accomplish. Countless numbers of people. His brothers tried to steal it. Mrs. Potiphar tried to steal it. The butler forgot about him in prison. They tried to steal it. But he refused to give anyone so much power that they could steal what God was trying to do. Joseph's life teaches us this. Oh, man. I studied this man's life for 20 years. Can't wait to meet him. Joseph's life teaches you this that God may not take you to the top until you have the grace to forgive those who hurt you on the way up. If your mindset is, I'm going to show them, I'm going to vindicate them, I'm going to show her she shouldn't have left me, I'm gonna if your mentality is all about what you're going to do and your vindication and you get it even and you, you coming out smelling like a rose and looking better, Joseph would say God may not take you to the top and so you have the grace not to forgive those who hurt you on the way up. See, if Joseph could come to this meeting, he would want you to know that other people can stop you temporarily, but only you can stop yourself permanently. Oh, they can, oh don't get it twisted. They can stop you temporarily, but only you can stop yourself permanently. Even Joseph's brothers, when they met up with him, the first thing that came to mind 22 years later was how they dogged him. Now, I don't know about you. I got two brothers. <laughs> I'm second in command, and they come to me and they need help. As soon as I see them, I, I'd be like, oh, boy, your butt's mine now. I'm going to wear that out. My name is Joe Seth. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to wear that out. 22 years? Will you cast me some food? Joe Seth. <laughs> Judas. Judas' life teaches us this, be careful what you become in pursuit of what you want. Oh, be careful what you become 
in pursuit of what you want. See, the world say Judas, he got, he got paid 30 pieces of silver. One small problem. After he got the 30 pieces of silver, he hated himself. And he hung himself and committed suicide. Be careful. Be careful what you become in pursuit of what you want. The world will tell you that it's a, it, it's a victory. You won. You got paid. Get paid. Get paid. What did Randy Moss say? Cash money, homie. <laughs> cash money. The world will tell you it's cash money, homie. But Judas will tell you, be careful what you become. Or you may get the promotion. You may get the position. But do you realize Judas' life teaches us that in pursuit of the good life, most men leave behind a trail of broken relationships yes. with their family, with their spouse, with friends. Oh, be careful what you become in pursuit of what you want. What are you becoming? You're a man. We talked about in the heart of every man it pounds the desire to be significant. What are you becoming in pursuit of what you want? Are you becoming a man of more character, more integrity, more honor? Or are you becoming an ego, maniacal, self-absorbed person who only has room for you, me, myself, and I, and that your wife's a nuisance, your kids are a nuisance, and your church is a nuisance? Be careful what you become in pursuit of what you want. So powerful. Why are we studying these men's lives? Because we want to get this stuff down, man. See, the goal is to leave as minimal amount of collateral damage as possible as you evolve into the man that God's called you to be. And what starts out as a miss mist for a man becomes a fog for his family. Amen. Let's wrap it up. Thank you for your attention. Let's talk about, I just want to talk about very quickly reasons why you need male friends. Everybody say male. Male, male friends. Number one, you need male friends and you need to open up to another man about your insecurities, uncertainties, and this desires for one reason and one reason alone. You need a masculine voice to validate that what you're going through is not crazy. It's not to justify it. It's not to encourage you to be trifling. But if I were to say, you know what, when I was walking here to speak, did you see that, 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 that lady who's at the front desk? Man, it's like, we don't, you don't have to finish the sentence. She's like, you see that lady at the front desk? <laughs> you don't have to finish the sentence. The other one knows exactly what you're talking about. Now, see, if you go to a woman or your wife and share this, her, she'll get defensive. What, I'm not enough? What, these birthmarks are not enough? What, raising these three kids are not enough? What, me going out to the work? What, what's wrong with you? Are you some kind of animal? <laughs> what is your problem? What is your problem? You need to listen to Pastor Tony. That's what's wrong with you guys. Another dude would be like, nah, bruh. Welcome to the flesh. Now, you don't yield to the flesh. Being tempted is not a sin, y'all. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. It's yielding to it. See, the enemy wants to beat you down and have you feeling condemned just being tempted. Dude, there's 18 billion Im naked images on the web. So you need male friends so that somebody can look you in the face, not justify, not encourage you to be, continue to be trifling, but to say, yeah, I get it. I get it. Wife does, has some sort of crazy emotional response at you. You need someone to say, yeah, that, that's, that's, 
It bees that way sometimes. It bees that way sometimes. Number two, the reason why you need male friends, everybody say male. male. Because it will lessen your dependence on women. Do you know the number? Lust is undefeated. Do you know the number of men who have gone to a woman for emotional help and it's turned physical? Ah, uh, but I have quiet time, Brother Chris, in the morning. You should see my you should see the CDs in my glove compartment. I got this. I got this. The number of guys who have gone to a woman. See, here's Satan's trick. He wants you to satisfy a legitimate need in an illegitimate fashion. It's a legitimate need to want to be heard, to want to experience empathy, to have someone to talk to. But it's illegitimate if you go to the wrong source. It will lessen your dependence. I said this last week. When, John, when David had Jonathan in his life, his trajectory was going up. David had Jonathan. Moses had Joshua. Paul had Barnabas and Timothy. It's almost a guarantee that if you keep sharing emotionally, it's going to turn physical. Don't tell your secretary at work your marriage problems. Come on. Come on. Don't tell your colleague. It always cracks me up. Women be sharing things with each other and they be at the beauty salon. Girl, what you need to do is, and what you need to do is, and what you need to do, she ain't been married in 15 years because she's driven off three dudes. Girl, what you need to do is, it's like, well, what are her credentials? Besides, she can tie a tight knot. And be a therapist for two hours for 60 bucks. <laughs> well, what you need to do is. She done wrecked three marriages, turned Boaz into Boso. And chicks are listening to her. Come on. Number three, the third reason why you need male friends is because they can help you in a crisis to help normalize things. You talk to someone who's been married a little longer than you, they'll say, dude, this is what happens in marriage. Don't, 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 don't freak out. I'm not saying it's easy. Right. Don't panic. Right. Right. This is what children do. Yeah. Don't panic. I have three boys. I have two girls. They can help normalize it. But there's some things you might be better suited going to a man. Not you might be. You will be better suited. <laughs> going to a man who's not going to receive what you're sharing in an emotional fashion that ends up distracting you. Because remember, you can't show weakness. You're a man. So they can help you act. As, they can help act as a buffer. All right, I, I, I was bankrupt once. All right, it, this is what I did. OK, I was divorced once. This is how I found. OK, my kids didn't talk to me for years. My, OK, but this. They can act as a buffer. Because remember, without another man to talk to, you're suffering silently. Mm -hmm. And the man credo is, I'll just crank it up. I'll just keep cranking it in my, in my head. I keep turning it over. Oh, I haven't figured it out yet? I know the answer. Crank faster. No, that's not the answer. And a multitude of counselors is safety. In mm -hmm. community, safe community, there are guys in this room, you've talked more in the breakout session today than you have in the last three years about intimate things. You know why? You felt safe. And a word of advice, if you, as a collective group, if you violate the trust of the collective group, 
you create, you've committed man treason. <laughs> On the street, snitches get stitches. stitches. <laughs> <laughs> That's treason. We're trying to create, we have no place else to turn. And you, and you violate a, a sacred trust? Snitches get what? Last but not least, you need male friends simply because they minimize loneliness. It's amazing. I love to play golf. I'll be on the range. There are dudes, they don't even know my name. Hey, bro, you getting ready to go out? You, you, you ever want to play with? They, 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 don't even, they don't even say, hey, I'm Frank, I'm Joe, I'm John. It's just like, dude, you, you, ever, you go to the park. You got next? You got five? Yeah, yeah. Okay, bet. Oh, yeah, all right. Can I run with you? Yeah, can I run with you? <laughs> and the world will say, let's go grab a beer, let's go grab a drink. Or let... Men are starving for safe places. You need male friendships to minimize loneliness. <laughs> Where you can do something that interests you. So let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for who you are. We just, I, I commend these men. These are your sons. You're proud of them. They're the apple of your eye. You love them. Even with their weaknesses, their challenges, my weaknesses, my challenges, you love us. You've given us an awesome, daunting responsibility, but an awesome, daunting privilege. Lord, it's my prayer through the tools that your spirit shared today, through the community that I believe and pray will be formed and continue to be formed, that every man will rise up and become all, not part, of what you called him to be. Thank you for the wisdom to become king, prophet, and priest, and like the Apostle Paul in the last chapter of his life, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Oh, I love this verse. He said this, Now the time of my departure is at hand. Last words he ever spoke. If you know anything, my brother died of cancer, and you remember the last words a person speaks. These are Paul's last words. He said, Now the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. I'm going to die empty. No unused potential, no unspoken love, I'm going to give it all that I got. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my race. But now there awaits a crown of righteousness. But not just for me, but all those who will follow my godly example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.